Okay, so entry number eight is this very masterful uh, contribution by Tristan. And um, I feel that this is not just ready for the stands with a few minor tweaks, which I'll, I'll make some suggestions. But I mean, it's ready to be published, pretty much. And Tristan actually is a published orchestrator. He's, um, I, I think... People who've been with the orchestration online group for several years will remember how Tristan started orchestrating Rachmaninoff arrangements and ended up getting published. And yeah, we just were really cheering him on. And and his yeah his sense of uh, form and history and and proportion and everything else is just first rate. Um, I have one or two issues here and there, like you know I would probably have with any score. Um, just, you know, just sort of thinking and analyzing and stuff. But I would like to also point out a lot of the things that are really great about this. Now, we're going to play the mock-up and the score now. And um, it's, you'll notice that Tristan has actually taken some pains with his mock-up. And uh, my, my uh, screen is just jumping around here. So let's have a listen. Uh, to this really very, very cool uh, orchestration, and then we'll come back with some comments in just a minute and a half. Okay, so there are a few things in here that I would sort of question in terms of, you know, capability. Like, for instance, we've got these, this high B-flat in the trumpet um, at triple P. I, you know, I just don't think that's possible, mute or not, you know. Um, even the high G is going to be problematic. So, <clears throat> you know, that's those are... Those are places where the choice of instruments could easily change. You know, this could be played, these two notes up here could be played by flutes, right? Or or some other kind of combination that would go well with the oboes. But I just I just think high B flat on a triple P, I'm just not seeing that on, um, you know, in terms of, of functionality. But there are so many other really, really cool, um, so many other cool, touches and cool things that, you know, we could almost look at this as like, like the penultimate draft, right? And then just fixing a few things. And yeah, and yeah, I, I think you should try to publish it, Tristan. I think it's very, very cool. So <clears throat> here, I kind of need to know how many clarinets there are, right? So I'm, I'm assuming there are three because you eventually have E flat coming up. And I, I think with the work of this complexity, even though it'll mess up your page scheme here of, you know, wanting two reduced systems on your first page, I just really would like to see a big splash page, especially since there isn't, you didn't provide a page that like really showed like 
or told me what all the instruments were. And that's a shame because now I can't really describe it to my students and just like, you know, I'll just have to, to point things out as we go along, okay? All right. Now, the opening, um, and I, I've said this uh, to, you know, almost every entrant, and, and it does apply to you. I um, hate to say this, Tristan, but I do feel that you could have come up with a different scheme for your bowing uh, for um, for stating some of these melodies. And, and just in general, um, you know, I, I feel that just putting a, a big slur over two bars of, of or three bars uh, of winds is just not enough really to express. Now, I yeah, I mean, yeah, there are Ravel scores that do that, but if you look at the actual parts, um, those same parts as they are taken over by real players, you'll see that, you know, the the long slurs have been chopped up and then, you know, different, different um, slurs have been, smaller slurs have been put in that bring different emphases to the part, right? So, I mean, that would be part of the rethink that I would want you to consider. I mean, you could just leave that out and let them worry about it or let the concertmaster worry about, you know, some of these longer slurs. But I, I just feel that, you know, leaving that up to them is really not, um, you know, <clears throat> is not the most careful approach. So I really love the, you know, what you did with muted strings. And there are just beautiful touches all throughout here of that sound and 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 I love the way that you keep things, you, you force things on the fourth string. Now notice everybody, um, this is obviously pretty much sol G as it stands right now, because that is just where the, you know, that's the, the depth of the string that you're going to need to play these pitches. Um, however, once they rise, Tristan makes sure to remind us that sol G is going to continue as a color. And also here as well, um, you know, this A-flat, of course you would need to be sol G in order to dive down. There's lots of these uh, slides and uh, going on in different places, and they, you know, if you have a muted string, uh, then it works out pretty well, you know, if it's a more of a background sound, okay? And these are nice little touches from the harp. Not, you know, it's it's a bit of a copy of the piano part, but it does work pretty well all the same. And nice, you know, syncopated note from bassoon right there. Yeah, it's 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 structurally it hangs together very nicely, and it's actually this first page is is actually fairly simple scoring, but it's nice that there are variations of tone and emphasis and everything else. Okay, now horns come in softly. I, I think in a practical way, this might actually want to be scored a little under where it is now, like pianissimo rather than piano. Um, and we've got our rising bassoons. Okay, taking us to the next system. Okay, this works really well. The clarinets under the bassoon. Um, I, you know, I, I wish that we had seen a little bit more of this. Um, yeah, just that kind of that kind of thinking enclosure um, uh, in in different ways, more experimentation with enclosures. I mean, there's some composers did it really brilliantly, but yeah, this is a really great example right in here. And I, and I love the, you know, this this little touch here um, of second bassoon, uh, emphasizing the uh, sort of half bar, right? The, uh, the, uh, the D flat that comes up from time to time. Okay. Um, so yeah, so once again, just I really feel the horns need to be softer, right? So if this was pianissimo to P and then then, um, then, then diminuendo. That would be great. Now, there's a bit of micromanaging of, uh, of dynamics from here, you know, here and there. Um, you know, I don't even need, I don't, I don't even know if you needed to go up to those dynamics or not, but there's so much going on in the score. I don't want to turn it into like a big orchestration lesson on the one hand and a big like score analysis lesson on on the other, so I'm not going to go over it too much. This is a really nice touch in here. This um, this uh, stopped horn, and notice here's a tie, right? And just like I mentioned a few scores back, the little stopped sign is marked over both notes, right? And that sort of takes away any questions 
you know, if you leave the stop mark off of the second one, people, the hornets will naturally assume that it's meant, they're both are meant to be stopped. But what if the, you know, what if they run into some composer who thought that, no, this is like changing from stop to open, but I just forgot to put the open sign on there. Or when I leave this plus off, doesn't it turn back into open? You know, so the questions of composers who don't know how to mark things exactly uh, will cause players to second guess when they see an incomplete marking and then up goes the hand in rehearsal, right? So yeah, so this is the proper way to mark it. So, and nice little, nice little additions here. Once again, you know, in the mix on your mock-up, you're able to control the, the, the dynamics, but me looking at this with my eyes and listening to it on my inner ear mock-up, it, it feels overbalanced. Um, so yeah, but it's still, it's still a beautiful idea. So just keep the horns down a little bit is my message there. Very nicely done here, right? And I'm assuming here, Tristan, that you are, you know, that this is going to sound an octave higher, right? Octave higher, same note without this harmonic, right? Octave higher and then there. So that makes the most sense, right? Because of what it's doubling. All right. Um, so arco half. I, I almost feel like you'd have to say half pizzicato, half arco right here, and then actually show the second voice. Um, yeah. Or, you know, or, or, or would you mean that half the desks are playing or, you know, after playing pizzicato? So, I, I mean, I, I still don't know exactly what that means um, in that context. So let's go on to the second page. Your, uh, your file is acting very cranky with my computer, I have to say. It's not it's for, it's not its fault. It's just my buffer is is getting a little overloaded with all of these videos that I'm uploading today. Okay, <clears throat> so now moving on. You know, once again, we have very very long phrases in the winds, which I feel could be shortened so that you can, you know, just by just by the way that you uh, break down into smaller groups, the tonguing and the slurring can become inflections in them in and of themselves that. That require less nuances, and actually there are are fewer nuances. I, f I feel you could add a few more nuances in terms of of you know little you know little touches of warmth here and there. But you do sort of make up for that by having little touches of color going throughout uh, your scoring. You know, little things added like a little harp there. You know, this little this little part on viola and so on and so forth. It's sort of the trading off of different accompaniment styles, the little triangle jingles. Okay, so that's, I feel that that's all very nicely done. Muted trumpets, this is great, and I love the way you have them in the background. Okay, <clears throat> now we're coming up here. Now here is somewhere where I would almost suggest that you, you either, I mean, something about this needs to change. Okay, if this is just a celesta part, the celesta has so much hanging, um, it has so many hanging tones that, that you know, that this will sort of kind of be meaningless, right? If the celesta player has the pedal down, almost nobody marked whether or not the celesta uh, was with pedal. Okay, but uh, anyhow, this might be interpreted by the celesta pedal, oh, sorry, celesta player to pedal each, um, to pedal each group, right? In which case, I think it's you would need to accompany it with some sort of marking, or have one long slur over the entire thing, right? Which just makes more sense in the frame of things. Or to have stems up for the right hand, stems down for the left hand, right? If that's what you mean. But you know, I think just all by itself, just just the slurs here are too short. Right, I know that it's sort of like groups of uh, of ideas. In that case, I think you should have cross staff beaming. Okay, I think that that would that would sort of take care of that. So it's just a just you know talking about the finer points here. These are beautiful. This string scoring in here, the um, the viola uh, artificial harmonic, viola artificial harmonics have a specific quality to them that is I feel is different from the uh, the violins and the cellos. They just have, um, you know, kind of almost more like a glowing, uh, sort of a luminous quality that's just quite different. Um, you know, um, it's a kind of a cool radiance 
as opposed to you know more squeaky by the violins and sort of more uh, more edgy by the cellos. There's something in there. That just the ch the violas because of the shape of the sound bar the sound box for the um, uh, for the instrument. Okay, um, and you know this is all good. Here you're you're sort of going from you know you're you're kind of adding this voice in of oboe and flute, and I mean that is a you know it, it could be a sign of insecurity, but from a more experienced orchestrator, I think you just want that color. It's it, it's occasionally used by um, by Russian and French uh, arrangers, and I mean I even saw some of this in Rachmaninoff is, you know, having oboe and flute play together in a line just to get that, you know, kind of something from each color. Um, so, yeah. Now here, two, you're, you're doing bass clarinet to E-flat clarinet, right? So, and, and you're not really doing anything with a bass clarinet that sort of focuses their embouchure in a way, you know, really makes demand so that when they jump over to E-flat clarinet, it's sort of like, it just really feels like they're starting cold. So, so that's that's pretty good strategy if you were thinking about it. Once more, we've got um, you know we've got the order of things changed a little bit. The oboes are under the E flat clarinet, and that's a beautiful color. This is very nice too, right? Notice that this is at the pitch. If we I had a big discourse on how um, harp harmonics in the um, in Sibelius they play the note they play the pitch that they are scored, right? Whereas the playback should actually be an octave higher. Uh, because that's what, you know, the, the harpist is going to see the note, they're going to pluck it at the pitch, and it's going to sound an octave higher, right? So Sibelius has got it all messed up. Anyways, but notice how these pitches are the same as these, right? Which are scored an octave higher at pitch, because that's the way that the uh, strings roll, right? <clears throat> okay, so yeah, so this is a really effective... You know, if they're both pianissimo, I would almost say that the harp here could be scored at P rather than pianissimo, just to adjust that balance a little bit. And I love this little touch of horn there. By the way, this is a lovely solution. There's like a, a bit of a puzzle that is you know, in these last three bars, and this is a really nice solution to that puzzle. Okay, so so I, I don't have time to get into it, but yeah. But you know what I mean, Tristan. Okay, um, now E-flat clarinet... Uh, this is lovely and extremely effective and will work at piano because the uh, E-flat clarinet just really has a beautiful command of its upper register and can and can get just subtleties up there that are almost never asked for. In fact, speaking of subtleties, I think that, that some nuances could have been added here, you know, not more than just putting the accent there. You know, da, da, and, and I almost feel like this demands to be uh, separate breaths or separate tonguing. Dun, da, 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 right? Rather than da, da, you know, the, I, I just, I just feel that this is going to get tongued no matter what we do as orchestrators. So, so, you know, I just, yeah, or it's going to have an emphasis on it that is as much of a tongue, as much a tonguing as, as, you know, is to the point where it might as well just be, um, you know, just have, have a separate, articulation on it. Okay, nice touches here in these uh, artificial harmonics. And I love the way the E-flat clarinet makes it all the way down to its throat tones, when then is taken over by the oboe. And, and that's just, that's lovely. Okay, it, I, it's, it's very effective. Okay. Uh, and then we've got just little touches of cold lenyu in here. <laughs> you know, it's probably something that you know, probably something that is not going to matter or not going to be heard very much in the in the long scheme of things. But it does keep it does keep the um, you know the pressure off of the harp. Okay, moving onwards. Um, just going to straight pits there. Uh, près de la table. Um, that is the the um, playing close to the uh, to the uh, the sound box. The sound. Sorry. The I want to say soundboard and soundbox at the same time. Close, playing close to the soundboard of the harp. Okay, so you get a sort of a guitar-like sound. Um, hard mallets. So um, 
Tristan is making the distinction between hard and soft mallets for the timpani. And sometimes this is this is the, this is a thing that the um, the timpanist will just ignore. They'll just say like, ah, yeah, I, I think I know what you want, and then they'll just use their normal mallet through the entire thing and give you the effect that they think that you want to hear. So you have to watch out for things like that. But still, okay. And going on, yeah, just like we have this um, this harmony in here with flutes and clarinets uh, as the oboe takes over the line. And then we go into octaves. Now here, I think this is all just pretty, pretty straightforward. Here's where it gets interesting, right? Because we have got uh, doubling. We've got octave doubling from the um, oboe and the and the English horn, which is in itself doubled by the bassoons, right? And the bassoons take this over really, really effectively. So um, clarinet, horns. Um, harp continuing, getting a little full in there, and and yeah, I'm 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 wondering if you intend like this to be uh, non arpeggiando or arpeggiando, so that would just sort of be the query for me. Um, and yeah, this is all fun in here. This little this little bit of motion. Yep, and then here, okay. So here we are getting to a pretty, you know, a pretty intense place, right? Um, it's almost like you know, the scoring here is so full; it is almost as if we are already at the um, the that big allargando appassionato, and um, the because of the sweeping, you know, the the um, the the timpani here the, i think that there should be a, a hairpin here just to just to basically really put a you know to to remind the conductor uh as well and also same thing here you know when you have these other crescendos you have these long crescendos at the end of it you know it's actually a french thing is to is to and a, and a russian thing is to just to chuck in a hairpin just to sort of remind everybody where they are at so that there's no question. So yes, you, you should put one in here and in, up in these parts too and here, right? It's not enough to just say back here. Um, so yeah, but you, there's this sort of sweeping from the timpani and the, and the harp and that sort of takes the place and also from the cymbal. It sort of takes the place of these notes here and like it, it, it sort of sweeps them away. Yes, the pitches are there, and yes, they're integral to the whole sound there. And uh, I'll give you a pass for starting on a note that nobody will hear. This E flat down here. I, you know, I mean, come on, it's, nobody's going to hear that. And you've already got that sort of area covered. Um, you know, it's you've got a mass of color there already. Uh, you know what I mean? So like, I, I think since nobody's going to hear it, it's better to start on the G or the B flat or even just like come in here. But yeah, no, you know, just not to waste any notes where they wouldn't be heard. But yeah, but I like the, um, I like the, the whole feeling of this. It's very cinematic, you know? Um, but yeah, but the structure of it is very similar to other, um, uh, appassionato sections, right? Which are were a few bars early for that. Okay, but still, it's very effective, and that means that you're going to really have to pay off when you get to the appassionato, and you kind of do. Now here, I feel that this is wasted, with all respect. That these um these triplets here, I mean, I think that they would have to be doubled by octaves. They would have to be marked up to fortissimo. They would have to jump up an octave. I think they're just like they're right where they are right now. They're just kind of like invisible uh, timekeeping. You know, I think once you get past here, the harp is pretty much, you know, except for the glissando, the harp is pretty much invisible. Um, but this is, you know, just the, the texture of it here, nice, you know, kind of rock solid uh, octaves and, you know, very easy internal harmony and everything else. Um, yeah, so this this is all... This is all pretty, you know, pretty general. Once again, like the end of it is is really what I'm enjoying is just how things are coming together with the stopped horns 
And, um, you know, uh, if you want to say open on the fourth voice, just have the little uh, circle below, right? Just so we, I, I think that that would, you know, you could put a circle there and just say, etc. right? And then, you know, rather than saying open. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, it, it does, the conductor does need a reminder, but yeah, okay. But that will all work well. Okay, so, so, um, once again, we have another glissando going up to here. And I think that from, for the period in which this was originally written by Ravel, he was into big sweeps. If you look at the, um, at the Mother Goose suite and at um, his orchestration of the noble and sentimental waltzes and so on, there are a lot of these big sweeping things, but even he like started to dial it back. Once he got to Le Tombeau de Couperin, he, he, he really stopped doing this this gesture, which was to become, you know, a mainstay, a staple of cinematic scoring, especially if you've heard like what the, um, the Corn Gold violin sonata that is based on some of his, uh, his film scores, man, it's just like, there's so many glissandos in the harp. It's just, oh man, it's like, um, it's a, it's a test to how many glissandos you can sit through. But all that aside, I think I, I will give you a pass on doing two, doing two in a row, building up to higher and higher pitches. Not so sure if this is really needed. You know, this bum, bria, da, 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 bum, bria, da, 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 da. I, I almost feel like you would need some kind of, you know, fortissimo crescendo on the, on the voices that do that little gesture in the middle to just really make it come off, right? Because it's, it's, it's getting buried in the massive texture that you've got. Now, actually... Could be even more massive, right? Hey, where's the trumpets? You know, no trumpets there. You managed to get through the appassionato section without overdoing it on the um, on the brass, and I almost feel like that's it's sort of counterintuitive there. Now, I noticed that you left a rest in here, which there is like an inherent rest on the uh, in the part because of of the way that the hands are sitting in the original score. So I, I don't think people had to leave a rest here at the beginning. So you know, if you do get this ready for publication, go go and look back at that and see, you know, at the compared to the original and just like, you know, because like that, the, the note is inherent, even though it's left out um, in the counter melody. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, if this is, I feel like this is a real um, kind of reimagining of, of the of the way that that section should work and you know props to you Tristan um, for for really putting that thought into it you know I feel that this is just really a master stroke here um, <clears throat> yeah I think let's look down up down up down up I think you should mark if you really want a down bow here you should really mark the up bow that comes before it right you could even go down bow here marking and then go up, and then up, and then down. I think I would I would actually add a few, and that way, the um, if you're going to stick with this bowing, um, which I think could be a little stronger, especially because of you know inherent, the inherent quality of of articulation versus just pushing with the breath on accents. Okay, uh, but okay, let's say that you leave it like this, uh, down, up, down up right so that the player is really gonna need to see that this is down up and then up here and then down there if you really want to just smash that as a down bow okay so there's not much more to say here except that i feel that this is it's good that this is a glock part and not a celesta part because you know it just you're gonna need something with that just real um you know something that can really compete in this area and i i like the fact that it is not slavishly uh, doubling the, uh, the melody, you know, it's, it's adding pitches that will be heard as part of the melody, right? So that is a really great approach. Now here, see, like, I just feel, I feel this is wasted. Um, I feel this is wasted at the pitch that it is, you know, an octave higher, it will be audible. Where it is, it will just get buried in the texture of everything else, especially with the second violins. Okay. Um, all right. Moving on. This is all lovely. I really want to get to this part here, but all right. 
Um, so you've got your two horns. It's interesting you had a two horn sound in your in your mock up all the way through to the end, and uh, maybe that is just I don't know the way that you did it. If you did this on a DAW separate, then um, I understand. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, core anguish. Uh, da, boy, I just really feel. Da, 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 da. I mean, I just feel that there is nuance that you could be putting in here by breaking up these slurs. Okay, but beautifully accompanied. Okay, and these lovely little touches here in the, you know, the muted strings. Okay, and then the little flute here. Now, this. Ha ha. I get the joke, Tristan. This is like right out of Firebird. You know, da 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 and I just love the little sultasto glisses and, you know, really far in the background. So this is nicely done. Uh, a bit fiddly with different dynamics, but nicely done. And then just, you know, getting more and more intense back to E-flat clarinet in its shalomo register. Very, un actually starts in the throat tones, but goes into the shalomo register. So you sort of hear the kind of cheap brittleness of it, right? And guess who answers it? And this is the cosmic joke to me, right? Is that, look, these are essentially um, like the same, the same basic pitches as written, but because the E-flat clarinet is pitched um, a perfect fourth above the B-flat clarinet, right? The next the next bit of melody is just the same thing down a fourth, right? So the score is exactly the same, even though it's different pitches. I just, I love transposition. I love the peculiarities of transposition. And, you know, what, what you, all these little jokes that you see on the page. Um, you know, and then we've got pizzicato with the bassoons. That's lovely. And then this little, um, this little rip up to that high A. So this all works pretty well. Um, yeah, and I sort of, this is this is a place where I've kind of missed the whole sense of like the pedal in the original part, keeping everything hanging in the air and then adding the, adding the notes at the end. But aside from what I feel is a somewhat unplayable trumpet part there on top, you know, it, I mean, it's playable to get a B flat on a, on a B flat trumpet, uh, up high like that, you, you know, a good trumpet player should be able to play those um, with no problem, except that not at P, you know, triple P. So, yeah, try to avoid scoring high notes at very, very, very soft uh, dynamics. So, I don't know. I mean, some of this is already covered by your oboe part, right? So uh, maybe you don't even need that high B flat at all, you know, or maybe you could. I mean, I think that the that the sound that you're basically going to get here is almost flute-like, so might as well just be flutes, eh? You know, and just leave the that low, written G to um, you know, to the second trumpet or first trumpet. All right. So look, beautiful score. This is just really lovely scoring, Tristan. And um, you know, I think you should do something with it. See if you can get it published or get it performed or. Something like that, you know, and and I mean, I feel I wish that for everybody, but this score is is probably closer to a state of complete preparation than you know most of the ones that I've seen. Some of our some of our more experienced orchestrators have have also turned in things, and I've commented on those as well. You know, that state of preparation being very close. Um, but you know, sometimes I've had very experienced orchestrators give me something that's more like a sketch, you know, the understanding that, um, that of course, like it's not, it's, it's really a first draft. It's not a, it's not a final draft. And that is something I take into account too. So anyways, great job, Tristan. And, um, would really love to, to include you in any of these orchestration challenges in which you have time. Okay. And now on to score number nine.